Hello, this is Dr. David Donahue. We are talking successful aging. Welcome to session nine of our program in which we will talk about superfoods and superfood villains, heroes and villains. So one of the things about food is it plays a big role in how well we age and how quickly our bodies age. This is Dr. Greger's uh, list, his matrix of all the different pathways by which we experience cellular aging in the, in the rows. And the columns are different kinds of behaviors we can take. So every time there's a checklist, a check in there, that means that that particular behavior can impact that form of cellular aging. So when we look at uh, certain plant foods, we're gonna talk about certain plant foods they have the power of selecting uh, a, a lot of these box, checking a lot of these boxes. But if you look more broadly at nutrition in general, it really encompasses a great many of, of the opportunity we have to slow cellular aging. And in fact, the majority of the ways in which we can slow down cellular aging relates to the food that we eat. So calorie restriction, certain kinds of protein restriction, decrease in certain animal foods, decrease in processed foods, and increase in certain plant foods like the superfood heroes we'll talk about. All these play a big role in how quickly our body ages. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about uh, 10 ways that a food can be beneficial or harmful for you. We're going to talk about 10 different dimensions of food each of which can um, place a particular food in a healthy or unhealthy category, category for a particular purpose. So we'll talk about inflammation, pr preservation of DNA and repair of DNA, the pH or whether it's acidic or alkaline, S -s the satiety, which is how much is it filling versus how much does it cause you to eat more calories, the insulin sensitivity or glycotoxicity of a food, meaning how much does this food induce insulin sensitivity and how much does this food drive me toward type 2 diabetes? Muscle growth, how much, what's the potential of a particular food to help grow your muscles? Cognition, does this particular food boost my, my memory and my cognition or prevent dementia or is it the opposite? The lipid effects, of how, does this clog my arteries or not? Other vascular effects such as driving up blood pressure and promoting healthy blood vessels. And then finally, uh, just bottom line longevity. Does this food extend life expectancy or not? So I'll share a good bit of science on all these different dimensions. Let's start with inflammation because it's a driver of so many diseases. We know that it's so important for cellular aging. So there's this concept called the dietary inflammatory index. And it's an attempt to measure the degree to which different foods might drive a cellular, excuse me, might drive inflammation or not. And so what we've found is that this dietary inflammatory index is a pretty useful tool because multiple studies have gone on and validated that, yep, the foods that are more pro-inflammatory according to the dietary inflammatory index, in fact, do cause more inflammation. And they're, in fact, are as associated with all these important diseases like our leading killer heart disease, cancer, pregnancy complications, and all-cause mortality. That is to say your overall risk of death. All of these things are affected big time by what is the dietary inflammatory index of the foods you're eating. So what are our heroes with respect to inflammation? Well, you can start with turmeric at the top. This spice had the greatest uh, anti-inflammatory score. Uh, and next comes fiber, dietary fiber, which is kind of a broad class of foods, as you know. Almost every plant food has a fairly unique form of fiber, uh, and there is no fiber in animal products. The flavones, which are among those kinds of flavonoid compounds, the colorful antioxidant foods, the isoflavones is one, another one of those flavonoids. Beta carotene, an antioxidant. Uh, then, then we get to a specific food like green or black tea is very high and in the top 10. Magnesium containing foods, 
flavanols, yet another flavonoid. And then we, as we look down the list, we see things like ginger, some of our favorites, ginger, vitamin D, uh, omega-3 fatty acids, some of the other vitamins, more flavonoids, garlic, more vitamins, and polyunsaturated fatty acids. And then we get down to zinc, onion. Curiously, uh, alcohol made the list. Uh, it was kind of not quite near the top, but somehow alcohol was found to be anti-inflammatory in this investigation, which uh, I'm not sure if that's been supported by subsequent research. My, my suspicion is probably not. So to summarize, turmeric gets the prize for number one, according to the, this research, uh, but, but more broadly fiber and eating the, eating the whole plant foods. Um, and then come the flavon, flavones, the flavonoids, um, well, especially the flavones among the flavonoids is a specific class, which includes the green and black tea, herbal teas, herbs, such as oregano, rosemary, and sage, the soy isoflavones, and then veggies like celery, parsley, and red peppers. If we look at our pro-inflammatory villains, these are the foods that cause inflammation in the body. It's mostly fat, especially saturated fat, but then total fat, trans fat, energy, which is largely a function of your fat intake because that's so much more calorie dense is fat than any other kind of food and cholesterol. So all these are kind of uh, directly related to consumption of meat, dairy, and eggs. Um, and that's exclusively where cholesterol, dietary cholesterol is found. Uh, oddly, vitamin B12 was found to be pro-inflammatory. Subsequent research does not seem to support that. So we do have to take this a bit with a grain of salt because it's not perfect. Um, your other macronutrients, such as carbohydrate and protein, are pro-inflammatory. They cause inflammation. This didn't break out carbohydrate, like simple carbohydrates from complex carbohydrates. As you know, simple carbohydrates like sugar is a very, very different food than is a complex carbohydrate like oatmeal. Um, and then iron is pro-inflammatory, no surprise there. And I thought it was interesting that monounsaturated fatty acids like olive oil were kind of neutral, kind of not quite pro-inflammatory, but not really anti-inflammatory too. So they didn't do so well. Pro-inflammatory villains, if we were to summarize, fat big time, especially the saturated fat and trans fat. Cholesterol, which is, largely comes from eggs and shellfish in our diets. Iron from meat and iron from supplements. Sugar and protein. So if we want to reduce our inflammation, we want to stay away from those villains. Let's, let's move to DNA preservation. There's, there's a, quite a few authorities who think that preserving our DNA is job one if we want to slow the aging process. And one of the things that causes the damage to the DNA is this oxidative damage, uh, which oftentimes it really amounts to rusting of the body because that's what, that's what rusting is, is you're oxidizing a, um, a metal typically but you can oxidize your DNA and that leads to DNA damage. So this other study looked at 3,100 foods, beverages, spices, herbs, and supplements and quantitated their antioxidant content. So this important study was done in 2010, thousands of foods in there. To summarize a very large document, we find that amla powder was number one. I think it merits special mention. It was off the charts antioxidant. Um, we have dried herbs and spices and dried berries, uh, and then fresh herbs and spices, fresh berries, and then there's a host of other foods that were antioxidant. We've explored those a bit in the course of this program, uh, especially the flavonoids were antioxidants. And another important learning from the, the research is that antioxidants may only work for an hour or two. So it's might well be important to eat them frequently throughout the day, maybe not just once a day. So some of your superfood heroes that can reduce DNA damage, we've got, uh, and these are, these are kind of the, the stellar uh, highlights of that list. The, the cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, broccoli sprouts, these contain the sulforaphane, that magic chemical, which is a, a powerful a DNA protector. Mixed nuts, one ounce a day. Tomato paste was found to be antioxidant. 
two tablespoons a day. Um, you can mix it in water and, and or you can drink tomato juice, ideally without the sodium. Um, cooked spinach, cooked carrots, green tea, here it is again. Orange juice and carrot juice, kiwis, cocoa powder, and dark chocolate as well. So there's many people's guilty pleasure, dark chocolate. Uh, superfood heroes that it can actually boost what's called the sirtuins. These are special enzymes in our body whose special function is to repair DNA. And there are some uh, learned authorities in this field who think that sirtuins are at the core of, of our, the rate at which we age. And if we can boost sirtuins, we can slow the aging process. And how can we do it naturally? At least a half an apple a day. Um, and cardamom. Uh, one gram, that's not a lot, that's like a, maybe a quarter teaspoon or less, three times a day. That bursts, boosts sirtuin activity by 30%, according to this research. So, we have our villains that, that uh, are active in inducing DNA damage. So this includes, well, salt. Heterocyclic amines, you can see that, these, these black marks on, the, on the, these grill marks on the meat which is so common uh, in when we are grilling our food. Um, the other thing that we see here is the browning, and that's uh, partially going to reflect the advanced glycation end products that are in the food. So here again, not ideal from a health perspective to cook meats at a high temperature. Oxidized fats are formed when we cook meat, uh, and they are present in the fryer oil, the fryer oil of uh, how we cook French fries, very, very unhealthy, partially because of its oxidized fat content. Oxidized cholesterol from milk powders, white meats, dairy, eggs, and irradiated meat. So when we irradiate the meat, we sterilize it, and we avoid one kind of pathogen, like the diarrhea-causing bacteria, but we also damage the uh, oxidize the cholesterol, and so we damage our bodies in another way. Ghee, the Indian clarified butter, is an important source of um, DNA damage, according to some research. Another dimension is the pH. That is to say, is this acidic or is it alkaline? And there's considerable evidence that we want to eat foods that form more alkaline. Our, our bodies really should be close to this pH of 7 in terms of whether we're producing acid or base or alkaline. Uh, a lot of us live at a more acidic pH in the West. When we eat more uh, acid-forming foods, we can have what's called diet-induced metabolic acidosis. And this can cause things like uh, osteoporosis, thinning of the bones and bone mass. This can cause uh, kidney stones for sure. One of the strongest ways of preventing kidney stones is to alkalinize the urine, turn the urine to be more alkaline rather than acidic. Uh, it causes insulin resistance when we have acid, uh, acid forming diet, and it can lead to loss of muscle, and it can lead to elevation in blood pressure. So all these complications from having an acid forming diet. Uh, what are our heroes that can alkalinize our bodies? Uh, it's fruits and vegetables, overwhelmingly. In particular, we have uh, pomegranates, dates, coconut water, guava, and prunes. So you'll see um, some trends here as we look down the list. Banana, green grape, dried grape, raisins, melons, purple grape, papaya, kiwi, apple, avocado, pumpkin, apricot, cherry, watermelon, beets, and carrots. So these are, and one thing I'll mention is prunes uh, really had the biggest alkaline forming effect. The problem with prunes being down at number six is because their um, serving size was determined to be smaller. But if you were to eat a good 150 grams of prunes, you would get a big whopping dose of, um, of lowering your acid load, increasing your pH, increasing the alkalinization of your body. Um, so our alkaline, uh, just to summarize, our alkalinizing heroes include the exotic fruits like pomegranate, guava, banana, papaya, melon, and kiwi, dried fruits like dates, prunes, and raisins, other fruits like apples, apricots, and cherries, 
and coconut water. So what are our villains? Um, it's meats. Uh, it's lobster, number one. Um, it's also seafood. Um, so as you look down the list, it's pretty much all seafood or beef or chicken. Uh, we do see the Brazil nut here. Uh, being a, a acidifying villain, so we don't recommend eating a lot of Brazil nuts, but the occasional once a week Brazil nut, even a couple of month Brazil nuts, have been found to be possibly beneficial to our uh, cholesterol level and heart disease risk. Uh, and then you do see a little bit more um, cashews also on the list, but and granola, and uh, but otherwise everything is meat, seafood, dairy, and eggs. So our acidifying villains, seafood, meat, milk, cheese, and a couple nuts on the list. So beware. Now, the next dimension I want to talk about is satiety. How full does the food make you feel? Because this is an important feature of food. Is this a food that you're going to eat and you're, st you're still ravenous after you eat it? Or is this a food that's going to fill you up and so you just don't eat as many calories? So there's this idea of the satiety index, which is, how filling is a food per calorie. And what we want is a food that's really high in satiety, packs a lot of um, satisfaction without packing a lot of calories. So we want a high satiety index in our foods. Number one was the boiled potato. Uh, also on the list, white fish, um, porridge, brown pasta. We have uh, oranges, apples, grapes, um, so these are all more satiating per calorie than, say, white bread, which is this line here. White bread is here. So certain foods are even less satiating than white bread because white bread kind of turns to nothing when you eat it up. It's a highly processed food, so it's a calorie-dense food. But when you eat things like salted peanuts, that's less satiating. Uh, and then you have your croissants, cakes, donuts, chocolate bars. Uh, so the more sugar the more added oils and fats, the more calorie dense, and the less satiating, the lower the satiety index. In particular, what they found in this investigation is the foods that were the most satiating per calorie were the ones that had more water, secondarily, more fiber, and thirdly, more protein. So the content of the water, fiber, and protein made a food more satiating per calorie. And inversely, if it had more fat, it was less satiating per calorie. So steering away from the high fat foods can be a great strategy. So another food that reduces hunger has, is uh, when you eat chlorophyll, and you can see the chlorophyll in this food. This is uh, a form of kale that's very, very dark green. You can see that it's just very rich in chlorophyll. Uh, chlorophyll is the green pigment in greens and in, in, in vegetables. Uh, so it turns out there's good research that says that eating your chlorophyll fills you up. Uh, there's certain foods that can boot, boost so-called GLP-1, glucagon-like peptide 1. And what happens here is this is the same uh, receptor, the GLP-1 receptor, that's stimulated by drugs like uh, Wegovy, or Zepbound, or Ozempic, or Munjaro. So those foods, those medicines, stimulate the GLP-1 receptor. And what that causes you is for you to feel full. Well, certain foods can do the same thing, maybe not quite as potently, but they can still have that effect. And here they are. Berberine, as we see in barberries. Tea again, curcumin, turmeric again cinnamon, quercetin, which is one of the flavonoids, and fenugreek, a Indian spice, a seed. And then we have high fiber grain products like nuts, avocados, and sweet potatoes. And then we have uh, the short chain fatty acids that form in our gut when we eat high fiber foods. So all these things can have a GLP-1 like effect, a little bit like taking Ozempic. Um, so barberries, you can take just about two tablespoons a day to get a decent effect on that GLP-1 receptor so to suppress your... So these things are nice. They're tart. Uh, they're like a Turkey. They're, they're a typical ingredient in certain t Turkish dishes. 
So you want to rinse them off because they don't tend to come organic. You got to buy them online. <clears throat> Dr. Greger wrote a whole book on what does the science say about avoiding obesity and losing weight um, through food? So he lists a lot of these techniques in his in his Daily Dozen app. There's a feature called 21 Tweaks, and it's also listed in his book, How Not to Diet. And here they are. So we want to preload our meals with water. Fill, I say never fill the stomach with, never fill a dry stomach with food. Preload with negative calorie foods, and that includes salad and apples have been found in clinical trials. You eat the salad or the apple before the meal. You eat fewer calories in the meal overall than if you didn't add that onto your meal. Incorporate vinegar, two teaspoons with each meal. Try to eat in an undistracted way, and they say the 20-minute rule, which means take at least 20 minutes to eat your food. Uh, now, on an everyday basis, you want to... Um, Get your daily dose of black cumin, garlic powder, ground ginger, nutritional yeast, cumin, regular cumin, and green tea. Here it is again. Three cups of green tea for weight loss. Try to stay hydrated. Deflower your diet. Get that high-calorie food stuff out of your diet as much as you can. Try to front-load your calories. That is to say, eat more in the, in the breakfast and less at dinner and try to stop eating as early in the day as you can. The time restrict your eating. So trying to finish eating by six o'clock, say. Optimize your exercise timing. Weigh yourself twice a day. Believe it or not, weighing yourself more gives you more insight into what foods are causing more weight gain and you can lose weight. It's counter to much of the conventional wisdom that says that we should, uh, we should keep the scale hidden uh, when you get that biofeedback of weighing yourself even twice a day, you get even more weight loss. And complete your implementation intentions has to do with setting policy. I don't eat birthday cake. I don't eat uh, sweet desserts. Uh, you know, you set your own policy of what you're going to do. I'm a vegan. I don't eat animal products. These are, these are strategies that different people use and find helpful to keep away from certain classes of uh, w foods that cause weight gain. We talked about glycotoxicity in a past program. This is another way in which foods can either slow or accelerate aging. Um, so you have the internal glycotoxicity from insulin resistance and diabetes, and you have the external glycotoxicity. This is when you're eating those glycotoxins directly. It's, they're also called advanced glycation end products. And advanced glycation end products, as we saw in that browned meat, but it's also even browned toast, especially cooking meats at high temperature. What does it cause? It causes problems with uh, brain, uh, the brain, the lungs, the heart, the liver, your joints, your kidneys, not healthy for the body. The number one source of advanced glycation end products was this character, which is the roasted chicken thigh with skin on, barbecue, and look how much gly advanced glycation end products off the charts, a huge quantity. But even grilled hot dogs, broiled chicken breasts, these are still quite high in advanced glycation end products compared to what you could be eating, which is like a roasted yam, a, raw, a salad with raw tomato on it, oatmeal. These things are very, very low. I mean, much, much lower in, in those glycotoxins, the advanced glycation end products. Interestingly, when we cook something like a chicken breast uh, when we broil it it's got 6,000 but when we boil it cook it at a lower temperature same food a lower temperature 1,100 so the way we cook the food the temperature at which we cook the food uh, matters a lot and people say what about air frying well if, if you're cooking something at high temperature in, in a drying condition you're going to boost its its advanced glycation end product we do see Mostly it's animal products at the top and plant foods at the bottom, but you can eat broiled tofu does get pretty high numbers here. So it might be healthier to cook our tofu at lower temperature. Which foods cause diabetes? Well, really it's anything that boosts belly fat. This includes um, all those calorie dense foods, all those foods with a low satiety index uh, that we talked about. Um, 
And it, it also in particular includes foods with branched chain amino acids, which are largely concentrated in meats. There's evidence that these particular amino acids increase our insulin resistance and uh, drive us a little bit more toward diabetes. And in general, higher fat diets, fat seems to be a particular promoter of insulin resistance because insulin resistance is largely fueled by fat that is accumulating inside the liver and the pancreas. And when that happens, uh, those cells of the body, the liver cells and the pancreas cells can't do their job. They can't bring that glucose in the, into the cell and store it away. They can't mobilize the glucose when we need energy. Um, so we want to eat more fiber. Um, so recall that we talked about this, that everybody has their personal fat threshold. That is a threshold of body fat level at which we start to develop insulin resistance. And that, that personal fat threshold is largely determined by your genes. But what they found in this investigation, when they looked at people with early stage type 2 diabetes, when they were able to lose 6.5% of body weight, 70% of them were free of type 2 diabetes at one year. So this is a reversible disease, especially in its early stages, type 2 diabetes, reversible disease. We ran a program in years past uh, called Cure Diabetes to over 20 groups, and we had a lot of folks report big success. Um, so when you drop the body fat, in particular when you drop the fat in the liver cells, and, and the good news is that when you lose fat, uh, you're mostly losing it. You lose it first and foremost from the visceral, from the organs, from the liver. And so you do have a powerful potential of reversing insulin resistance. Um, and then fat in the pancreas can drop as well. And you can actually boost insulin production. One of the things we're, we're taught in medicine is once diabetes is a, has affected your pancreas, it's never coming back. And that pancreatic damage is irreversible. But what they find in Investigations like this one is that at least some of it can come back and you can even become non-diabetic. So which foods can help reverse diabetes? Well, it's, uh, there's special mention for all the foods on this list. You can kind of scan down it. Uh, some of it's our, our, uh, our familiar friends here. But, um, and you see things on the list like um, avocado, interestingly, banana, uh, so there's evidence of all these different foods helping to reduce insulin resistance. Um, what about muscle growth? Let's talk about the dimension of muscle growth. How do foods impact that? It's mostly a function of resistance training. There's a lot written about eating uh, vast quantities of protein to try to boost muscle growth. The research is largely unconvincing to me. Um, what is convincing is that it is about resistance training. So um, as long as you're, now there are some folks who aren't getting enough calories and aren't getting enough protein to allow their bodies to uh, produce the maximum amount of protein possible, especially young adolescent athletes. Uh, those folks might have a higher protein requirement, but for the rest of us, especially as we get older, uh, at least get that 0 0.8 grams per, of protein per kilogram of lean body mass, uh, per day. I'll put a plug in while we're talking about resistance training for my favorite version, which is as promoted in this book, Deep Fitness. Uh, they, they have a, a method called Mindful Strength Training to Failure, which has the potential benefit of, uh, in a short amount of workout time, yielding big re uh, benefits throughout the body. So let's jump to cognition. Which foods Preserve that thinking brain of yours. Uh, to summarize a lot of science, um, in general, berries have been found to reduce brain age and improve cognition. Certainly aerobic exercise is not a food, but it's worth mentioning. Sleep, not a food, but also worth mentioning. And then as far as other foods, soy products have a pretty good amount of evidence that they can boost cognition and slow dementia, green tea, and green leafy vegetables. Vascular health. So brain health is partially a function of vascular health, blood vessel health. We've run a program called Heal My High Blood Pressure, which talks about what are all the ways we can reverse high blood pressure, because high blood pressure ends up being one of the main contributors to the aging of our blood vessels. 
And it, to summarize a whole lot of science, we want to eat less salt, we want to eat less fat, and we want to eat more green leafy veggies to boost our nitrate production so that our, our blood vessels can be youthful and dilate when they need to dilate. So greens in all their forms, you can put them in green smoothies, you can put them in Buddha bowls or, or big varied salads. <clears throat> you can steam them. There's some, by some evidence, by some criteria, steamed, veg, uh, steamed greens are better than non-steamed greens. Um, lipids play a big role in blood vessel health. This is actually brain blood vessels, brain arterioles. Uh, on autopsy, they looked at folks who had dementia and look how much clogging of the arteries is going on in these brain blood vessels for people with dementia. So lipids uh, obviously play a huge role in heart disease and dementia and many other diseases throughout the body because they clog up the arteries. Um, so what are your lipid lowering foods? Well, in particular, the whole food plant-based diet. In fact, when we have people in our program switch uh, to a whole food plant-based diet, we see the cholesterol level drop off the table. It just drops to a very low level. Uh, you can get reduction in cholesterol levels akin to if you had started a statin. Uh, and, and so in particular, whole grains, vegetables, fruit, veggie, and nuts. Soy products have been found to lower cholesterol. Green vegetables, avocado, and almonds. Oats, barley, and canola oil are some uh, noted um, uh, superheroes when it comes to lowering lipids. So what's the number one longevity nutrient according to this research in which investigators um, took some 800 participants and followed them for two decades and followed the foods they were eating prospectively and then looked back to say who lived the longest and what were they eating? And the answer was spermidine number one with a p-value of over uh, almost 10 to the minus seventh. So that is to say a, a very strong association between spermidine intake and longevity. Number two, manganese. Number three, folate. Folate is in the greens. Manganese, we'll hopefully get time to talk about in a future program. Not as much research on manganese, but spermidine. What is this stuff, spermidine? And, and what they found is that folks who were eating this more spermidine had 5.7 year lifespan extension. So spermidine is a, a substance that we make in our bodies, but as we get older, we make less and less of it. So we can get it from food, and there's evidence that dietary spermidine can improve memory, can improve function of hair follicles, can reduce cardiovascular mortality, heart disease death, can reduce um, cancer mortality. And there's, um, there's preclinical data that it has a whole lot of other effects, like on the immune system and reducing liver fibrosis and improving the kidneys. So spermidine seems to be a sort of a youth serum of sorts. The interesting thing about spermidine is the foods containing spermidine are totally different in many ways than the usual players. In particular, uh, I'll call out four four or five foods. Number one is maybe this stuff. And what is that grainy substance? That is dirt cheap byproduct of the food industry called wheat germ. Wheat germ, so you can't do it if you're gluten intolerant, but everybody else, it might make sense to have a tablespoon or two or three of wheat germ every day or more. Um, but number one was tempeh. Tempeh is a soy product, fermented soybeans. And you can, it's a very versatile food. You can do all sorts of things with tempeh. I eat it like a microwave it and put, slap it between two pieces of bread with a little hummus and salsa, say, and eat it like a burger. And it's, it's quite satisfying, very filling, rich in fiber, protein, um, also rich in ergothionine, which is also found in mushrooms. Essentially, ergothionine, another longevity vitamin only found in these two classes of foods, mushrooms and and tempeh, but mushrooms are number two on the list of spermidine containing foods. Then we have, uh, of all the fruits, mango is a rich source of spermidine. And I'll also mention green peas being a rich source. You do have cheddar cheese, lentil soup, uh, other soybean products, 
Lettuce is, is strong. And of all the milks, soy milk is number one in spermidine uh, content. Superfood villains with regard to longevity. Well, we've kind of covered uh, a bunch of di dimensions by which uh, certain foods can be unhealthy. But if we wanted to kind of list the, our, our arch enemies as far as uh, health goes, well, one would be alcohol, cancer causing and, um, and shortens life expectancy, despite what you might have heard. Recent research has really more or less invalidated the idea that moderate alcohol intake is healthy. Um, I think we saw ample evidence um, from multiple dimensions that foods like this cooked at high temperature, these uh, chicken thighs uh, are, are, are certainly uh, unhealthy and may accelerate aging. Uh, foods rich in saturated fats and trans fats like these cheese fries. Um, sugar sweetened beverages, lots of research evidence showing that these things are unhealthy and, and accelerate mortality. And then ultra processed foods like these vegan Oreos or chips or uh, all the all the um, the bliss inducing engineered ultra processed foods that the food industry has come up with to try to get us as addicted as possible to their their products. And when we talk about superfood heroes, <clears throat> this is a little bit of a judgment call. Like we've gone through a lot of different dimensions of what might make a food healthy. We um, ticked off a, a number of different foods along the way. We listed a number of different foods along the way, some of which keep coming up. So which of these foods that might keep coming up as we talk about the, the inflammatory nature of food or to the degree to which it can preserve DNA or the pH or the satiety in, inducingness of the food etc. Which foods would you put on that superfood list? Well, here's my list. Um, actually, this is my list. This is a list that one of my groups came up with, which is very similar to my list. But my list includes green tea, tempeh or soy, beans or lentils, wheat germ or other source of spermidine, cooked greens, and also raw greens, berries, flax meal, deserves honorable special mention among all the seeds um, because of its, its healing properties in lots of science uh, as, as determined by lots of clinical science. Uh, broccoli sprouts or broccoli is a rich, the rich source of sulforaphane. Garlic powder and ginger powder, um, turmeric, cinnamon, apples, Prunes or dates, with special mention to prunes, uh, lots of evidence of prunes being beneficial for different organ systems. Cocoa and probably cacao being a rich source of uh, flavonoids and, and possibly causing benefits to the brain and muscles. Mushrooms for their possible life extension and possible prevention of breast cancer and their spermidine content. And then finally, my beloved purple sweet potatoes, uh, which seem to be an important ingredient for the longevity of the people of Okinawa. Uh, lots of other good things about sweet potatoes in general. So I want to finish with um, some unrecipes. I call them unrecipes because they are recipes, but they are super ridiculously simple and they're very modifiable. My idea of a recipe is let's not make something that's really hard to follow, that's hard to re uh, repeat. It might be delicious, but it might take me hours in the kitchen. We want things that are vague, that give us instant gratification. We're, not, we're just preparing food. We're not cooking. Um, because I think this is important if we want to make a food a go-to that you can repeat uh, on a consistent basis, add it to your busy life. Um, so I like the idea of cooking foods in bulk um, because then you don't have to be cooking every day. Uh, it can be done daily or regularly, and it's memorizable. So one would be a cocoa tea. Uh, it's just a cup of green tea, or I have decaf green tea. Uh, add one tablespoon of cocoa, or actually raw cacao, like this, this particular brand. I like to look up my brands on consumerlab.com, an independent third party who looks at products and finds out which ones are free of contaminants and which ones are, are um, in fact labeled properly for what they contain. Uh, so cacao, 
Cocoa tea is, is a pleasant way of getting your, um, your green tea plus your cacao. Uh, it's a good morning beverage. Uh, by the way, green tea, there's kind of a right way and a wrong way, a little bit. Number one, you want to select a product that's rich in the flavonoids like the so-called EGCG, the flavonoid that green tea uniquely has. Uh, and you want to start with possibly this brand. Again, these are endorsed, not endorsed, but these per consumerlab.com end up being two of the better brands. So for decaf, it's Yogi. And for caffeinated, it is Trader Joe's. Uh, you want to use filtered water, ideally steep for about three minutes in hot water and don't add milk because the casein in the milk binds up the flavonoids in tea and coffee. Beware of adding milk to your morning beverage. If you want to go with milk, a nuttier milk is good old soy milk. This one seems to be the healthiest of all the milks by far. It's got spermidine. It's uh, so <clears throat> my nutty milk recipe. Soy milk tastes nutty. On its own, but I like to make it even nuttier by adding wheat germ, maybe flax, some spices, and just stir it up. And it's a little bit grainy, but it, it's a satisfying, filling, protein-rich, uh, spermidine-rich, and <clears throat> rich in spices, which are such a potent source of antioxidants, anti-inflammatories. Spicy steel-cut oats. Here's where you boil your steel-cut oats for 20 minutes. One part oats, four parts water. And then you just add stuff to it. And the flax meal again, pumpkin pie spices, berries, prunes, or dates. And you're getting your filling grains, which we don't eat enough intact whole grains. Steel cut are not quite intact, but they're more intact than most anything else you can buy in the grocery store. Um, low fat and low in salt. The tempeh burger. I mentioned is just a great way you cut, buy one of these at Trader Joe's because it's only two dollars and fifteen cents currently. Cut it in half, microwave it, slap it between two pieces of healthy bread or inside a healthy wrap, and have it with some something to moisten it up. And I find this super easy, simple, and filling. Purple sweet potatoes is ridiculously easy. The best way to cook them is to steam them. You preserve most of the nutrients. And um, then you just eat them like an apple. They're just these chewy, gooey, purple, sweet, uh, filling food stuff that you can eat on the go. It can be a meal. It can be a sweet meal. It could be a savory meal. Great thing about having meals like this is you're not adding any sodium to your diet at all. And this is a great way of ke keeping the blood pressure down. Have sodium-free meals. Um, in love with my red shred, I have to have a constant supply of this stuff. Uh, you basically use your food processor in the coarsest setting and just grind up a bunch of raw vegetables and shred them up. And, but here's the kicker is you want to add something that's a little sweet like apples and maybe balsamic vinegar. Uh, and, and then a little, something a little spicy on the tongue like ginger root and fennel. What a lovely flavor it has. Uh, pro tip, you want to lightly cook your beets and carrots. You bring out more of the flavonoids. But otherwise, just heap all these purple and red and orange foods all together in a bowl and just eat it like a crunchy, yummy, sweet salad um, every day. So your assignment, dear participant, is to try to eat the checklist every day and come up with your own un recipes, your own ways you're going to work these foods into your daily life. It's not good enough to find a superfood and eat it once in a while, once a month when you think of it. You got to work these into your daily life. So think about how am I going to eat the checklist? How am I going to make this thing happen? And so come up with your, your un recipes, share them with friends, post them on, on the web, tell all who will listen about how excited you are about your creation and go forth and eat well and live long and prosper, my friends. Thank you.